Hello, my name is Del Stevens. Some of you know me as the Tuna Dog. We've been working on a series of seminars during the Seattle Boat Show. Today's topic is going to be working the iron. Working the iron is more of a technique than anything else, but working the iron has, has proved to be a very effective method for bringing tuna up when they've been down deep. And our albacore fishery up here has early season, mid season, and late season to it. And many times in the mid to late season, the water warms up and those fish will be down in a thermocline. And I use it as an effective way to find fish. Um, you know, for me, for the most part, it, a lot of people troll to find fish, um, watch for jumpers, things like that. But I rarely troll. I haven't trolled more than three or four times in the last five, six years because of how I use iron to find fish. And when I say I use iron, I also will run offshore and I'll, I'll use the basics. You know, food is the key to locating them, water temperature, you know, all the different signs. You know, birds working the water, fish jumping, blue water, green water breaks, and the rips. And I use a web-based sea surface temperature chart. One of the things about this temperature chart that I use effectively is how warm is the water where I'm going to fish. I'm not only looking for good warm water and I'm looking for a jump and a break, but this chart also tells me that the water is warm enough that I'm probably not going to be able to fish on the surface very much and that fishing with iron to, to get down to them is going to be the more effective method. And what I mean by that is albacore tuna love 58 to 62 degree water, but they will move down when the water gets 63, 64 degrees. They'll move down into the thermocline that a lot of times is 40 to 70 feet down. And they won't come up for troll gear. You'll have the occasional fish that'll be up on the surface that maybe take a swim bait. Or they'll hit on the surface at the break of daylight or at the end of the day at the twilight. So, so your sea surface temperatures will tell you a lot about, one, how you're going to have to fish. You know, and then finding where you're going to go fish, using those is really important. And again, I fall back on my sea surface temperature and my chlorophyll charts as to how I'm going to fish effectively. And then I use the sea surface temperature charts on my ch chart plotter provided by Sirius XM Weather, which tells me the swells, the period, and gives me the temperature. And then one of the things that you need to be careful about with this is, is if you, every time you do a software update on your electronics, you should check the temperature that you're reading on your sonar with the temperature in the water. Get you a temperature probe, put it in the water beside the boat, check it to see if it's identical to what your boat is reading on your electronics. Many times after a software update, you need to recalibrate that. Otherwise, you'll get out here and you'll touch a spot and it'll tell you what the temperature is. That may not match the temperature on your boat. You could be off by a couple of degrees. So it could be a recalibration issue. And I have found for most people that have complained about Sirius XM weather not matching what their boat is, it was a calibration issue with their boat more than anything. So now you've used your web-based temperature and chlorophyll charts as well as maybe Sirius XM weather. You're offshore, you get out there to a spot where you want to fish, change your sonar zero to 70, zero to 100 feet, take it off auto, put it on manual, give you a better picture, and now you're on the hunt. And typically what I do is I'll run offshore to a certain spot that I have picked. I get out there, set my sonar like this, I'll turn my pan optics on, which this is an animation of it, and I'm shooting directly down like this one is. And um, the boat's right here. That's five feet out from the boat, 10 feet out from the boat, 15 feet out from the boat. And this shows a jig coming down and shows a f jig coming down now, and the fish comes in and takes it right there. It's animated. That's what it looks like under my boat when I'm fishing for tuna. So I get out to a certain spot I want to fish, I pull the throttles back, 
I have Weddy and Megan dropping iron and each one of them will have a different style of iron that they're dropping and will drop a different depth and I'll tell them based on this. And when they drop their iron down, if there's fish down there, the fish will react. Even if they don't take it, they'll react. And it tells, tells me we found the fish. And one of the biggest parts of albacore fishing is finding the fish. So this is a different view with a blue screen. Same looking down, same picture. This is a different picture looking forward. Here's your fish coming across and you'll see the jig come down right now. So you can see a jig dropping. They bounce that jig a couple of times. The fish turns. It's going back to it. It's going to jig it again. And there the fish took it. So this is what I use to find fish once I get out to a certain spot and I pull the throttles back. So now we've, we've picked our spot. We've ran offshore. We pull the throttles back. We've dropped, now we're starting to drop iron and we're seeing movement on the screen. We know there's fish there and we start fishing. Now, iron's one of those deals where it can either make or break your day. I had a day offshore here a couple years ago where I had a charter boat that I called in. We had a bite going. They threw some chum. Didn't really have very many people that knew how to fish iron on board. They were fishing live bait. They caught one or two fish and lost the bite. We lost our bite. And I also had another charter boat that came in. They only had one person who had to work iron and they weren't very good at it. And pretty much with the three boats in, we pretty much lost our bite. Those two boats left. We ran back up to where we started. We were by ourselves. We started dropping iron, started throwing some chum. We noticed them on our panoptics Garmin pan optic screen and start catching fish again. And this time I didn't call the charter boats back in, we just stayed there. It was a tough day of fishing. We had 23 fish at the end of the day and it was myself, both my ladies on board, Wetty and Megan that are really good at iron and two other people who don't know anything and they were catching fish. 23 fish. The one charter boat had six fish. The other charter boat had two. So iron made a huge difference that day because the fish were down deep. The wind was blowing quite a bit, which we were having to deal with as, as well. And we would typically run back up. Once we'd lose our bite, we'd typically run back up where we started and start drifting again. We didn't start, we didn't troll. We ran right back to that spot. We dropped our iron again, okay? With iron, the iron, has changed over the last few years and when we first started fishing iron about 15 years ago Shimano brought the butterfly jig system back into the market and re it introduced that new system and it was a high-speed jigging system some people refer to as yo-yo jigging. Along comes slow pitch jigging just in the last two years. Totally different, very different. Different action, um, you know, a, a much easier way to fish. High speed, high pitch jigging is different than high speed jigging. And then you casting. Some people will run a gun for jumpers with swim baits. Some people will use a small iron to run a gun for, for jumpers. So this lure here was only about 45 grams. It's the Daiwa Pink Ice. And I used it for casting. Long, great, great jig. I put a a split ring on the bottom of it with a about a three-aught sidewash hook and just put it on the spin rod and pitch it out after jumpers and, and pick them up. Works really well to just let it pitch it out and let it fall and they'll pick it up on the drop. With high-speed jigging it's a different rod, different reels, different lures. You typically drop the lure into the strike zone. You'll see it going down You'll see the fish react, and typically you're working the rod and bringing it back. And they're striking it when you're reeling it back, and it's darting coming back up and enticing the stri strike. This can be very tiring to work a rod real fast, pumping it and reeling it all day. You use parabolic jig rods. They flex from the tip to the butt, which distributes the weight, 
and also helps give it more strength since it distributes that load out all across that rod. A parabolic rod will also be much better on your back at the end of the day because it is spreading that load out. Some rods will shut off out on the tip of the rod and that gives the fish a lot more leverage on you and when you're fighting a 25 to 30 pound fish and you're not just reeling them in, that can get very tiring at the end of the day when you've fought quite a few fish. Those rods typically are five, five and a half to about six and a half feet in length. High speed jigging reels typically are, well typically they're tall, they're narrow, and they'll bring in 42 to 48 inches of line. When we say high speed tall reels, reel manufacturers will make them where they're tall and narrow to bring in that much line per crank. It's not about the gear ratio as much as it is about how much line comes in per turn of the crank. That's what you want to focus on. With a high speed jigging lure, the hooks, the assist hooks, are, are mostly on the top of the lure. And uh, as you can see here, that's the top of the lure here, bigger one here, okay. This is a different style of jig here, it's, even though it's in that picture. But uh, so the assist hooks are on top. They normally take the jig on the retrieve. They'll pick it up once in a while on the drop, but for the most part, most of the time, they're going to take it on the retrieve on a high speed jigging. So. People ask me, well, how heavy of a jig do I need to have? You know, for the most part, the rule of thumb is that you need to be able to drop 100 feet vertically in order for the jig to work properly. So if you've got a lot of wind and you're dropping a 140 gram jig, your line may be out here, you may have scope in the line, the jig's not working quite as effectively as if it was straight down. So you need to put a heavier jig on. But for those of you who don't want to buy a whole bunch and don't want to experiment, 110 grams to 140 grams is pretty common. I fish a lot of 140 gram jigs. For most days, unless I'm willing to fish a tournament that maybe it's real windy and has a lot of drift to it, most days I'm going to be fishing 140 grams on a jig. Slow pitch jigging. We say do less to get more. And that's because we are doing less. We're not pumping a rod real fast. We're not reeling real fast. It's not all about retrieving the lure as much as it is getting the lure into the strike zone and then finessing the lure. The difference between slow pitch and high speed or regular jigging is how your lure behaves. Very differently. With, it's very little movement by the angler, so it's not so tiring. All the action is in the slow pitch jigging rod, which is a little bit longer parabolic rod six feet to seven feet. Okay, Your reels should have, be open face, real smooth drags, and when I'm talking about real smooth drags and I'm talking about elbow cartoon, most of the time I'm talking about a reel that's got probably 20 pounds of drag on the minimum. Other reels with less, yeah they'll do it, but you'll see those reels with a fish on them and the, and the line will be coming off very radically. It'll, you'll hear it going zzz, 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 versus a reel with more drag, 22 to 40 pounds of drag, where it comes off just much smoother. A lot more drag surface, a lot smoother coming off. And when you've got a fish that is a hard fighting fish like that, the smoother drag works a lot, lot nicer. So you're using small precise movements to mimic a wounded fish try, trying and failing to swim away. And the lures typically look a little bit more like this. They'll have hooks on both ends because of the action of the lure. Here's slow pitch jigs. These are Daiwa, Daiwa Zebra Glow jigs. Shimano has their butterfly flat fall and whirly gig jigs. Williamson's crippled herring jigs. Daiwa SK jigs and the Nomad jigs are some of the most common ones out there on the market. I fish, I have fished all of these and I have caught fish with all of these. They all have uh, certain different aspects to them and how they work and certain days others work better than another one. Less is more. They're designed to flutter and jerk in the water imitating an injured bait fish. 
They also fall quicker through the water easily than a regular jig. You're mainly using your rod and you're fishing your rod diagonally and you typically bring it up about 90 degrees and then you let it back down. And you bring it up about 90 degrees and you let it back down. And then you add a little bit of reel action to it. Half a crank on the reel. You can vary that sometimes by adding a whole crank to the reel. So you're dropping a slow pitch jig down into the zone and you're working it. Very subtle. Up and down, up and down. And when you travel down with it, you, you don't want to go so fast that you lose contact with the jig because you won't feel the fish when it picks it up. So um, when we talk about slow pitch and fast pitch, if you were to cast a jig, we call that pitching it. At the same time, when we talk about slow pitch, when your rod comes up, it's causing the jig to pitch a little bit. And when a slow pitch jig is worked properly, when you lift the rod, the jig's going to come up and it's going to get flat and dart to one side. When you drop the jig, it's going to go down and it's going to dart the other way. And one end of the jig when you're coming up will have hooks on it darting one way. When you drop it, the tail end of the jig will have hooks on it and it's darting that way, which is why there's hooks on both ends of the jig. The up action causes it to work one way, the down action causes it to work another way. You're working both directions with a slow pitch jig. And it's the action of the rod that's causing it to work. With a slow pitch jig, the assist hooks again are at both ends. They come in all shapes and sizes, but one thing that's common about them is they're center balanced. They typically be, they're symmetrical in the fact that they're, they're pointed on each end and fat in the center. They're typically leafy, non-symmetrical, one side is flat and the other side is fat and has got some shape to it. There's three jig categories, fall jigs. These are typically fat in shape, designed to be erratic on the drop. And they usually do not work when they're pitched or when they're sliding. Responsive jigs are what we fish most of the time for slow pitch jigs. They're pointed heads and tails, and they're the most common out there that I showed earlier with the Daiwa and the Shimano and the Williamson and the Nomad. These are the Shimano jigs. And then your long jigs. They work better with a high pitch action. High pitch is not high speed. High pitch is longer intervals between the action. Okay, it's more pronounced and it gives the lure more time to swim. The whole key to these jigs, the slow pitch and the long jigs, is to give them, get them horizontal and with a slow pitch jig you're working three to five seconds of horizontal time. With a long jig, it's more pronounced and it's longer between there. You want to keep it horizontal longer. So it's a longer, more pronounced action. Okay. With a high, high pitch, you don't want to put the assist hooks on the tail end because the action is so pronounced, you'll be tangling the hooks up on the fluorocarbon on your, on your line. Just put the assist hooks on the top. Most people will put one there. And they're going to hit it typically on the top end because when you lift the rod, it's going to cause it to come up and it's going to dart head first. High pitch versus slow pitch. Slow pitch, the action is smaller and more finesse than high pitch, which is more dramatic, longer between the actions. This is a slow pitch jig, which is why it's got hooks on both ends. Your Saltiga SK jigs. There's your pink combinations, blue, pink, silver. Some of the most effective, and then the Zebra Glow. And they've since added even more jigs to that line. You can go on to the Daiwa website. 
look at them. These are slow pitch jigs. You can see that they're pointed at each end and they're typically, they've got designs on typically one side and either solid color on the other side. The Shimano jigs, these were the first ones that came out in the butterfly jig system 15 years ago and then it progressed to these guys which again these jigs as well as these jigs typically work with the high speed jigging action of pumping the rod reeling erratically and um, working that jig and then you've got to the the slow pitch jigs were pointed at each end come with two hooks on this end I still I would add two more hooks to the other end or at least one hook to the other end and then we have our casting jigs and the hammered diamond jig has been around forever the guys in Southern California have been fishing this thing for years and years your mega baits a lot of the guys that first got into albacore fishing in the Northwest would pitch mega baits something similar Williamson vortex jigs your William some abyss jigs. Then the Halco Twisty is something that new that a lot of people will fish up here. There's your Nomad Buffalo jigs, your pink, pink combinations. The one thing about jigs, I have found there's very few fish that won't eat a jig. Whether it's bottom fish, tuna, salmon, it's amazing where you go either throughout the Northwest or even in other countries fishing jigs. Here's a parabolic a picture of a parabolic rod that's loaded up with a fish on it. You can see this rod is bending all the way through. It's spreading the load out, which at the end of the day, her back will appreciate that. One of the things known for benefits of a parabolic rod. Now, I typically mount my clamps on my reels because that rod's flexing so much that it's flexing in the reel seat too. So you want to make sure that you're checking if you don't have a clamp on the back side of your reel, you can check that periodically through the day and make sure your reel is tightened down. So, because it will flex it and cause it to be loose. When you're mounting assist hooks onto jigs, this is the original butterfly jig system from a long time ago. It still is a basic setup with your jig here. You're, you're using a split ring and I would encourage you to not go to the store and just stick your hand in the bulk bins and buy split rings by the bulk. Those split rings typically are not test rated and they're not heavy duty enough to handle albacore. These are owner split rings and I fished the 5.5 size to number 6 size split ring and I put it on top there. And then I fish an owner solid ring 5.5 to 6, put that on top of there. And then I fish a Gamagatsu 510 model assist hook in a 2 watt and I put it on top of there. And if you're fishing a high speed yo-yo type jig, putting two on here, and I typically don't go more than 50% down from the top on a high speed jig that I'm pumping and fishing erratically. They're going to take it up here and because it's darting as it comes up. And um, as it darts one direction, they're going to open their mouth and they'll have the jig in their mouth. And a lot of times, you, does it make a difference if you have one or two? If you can afford to put two on there, put two on there. Some guys fish one. They're fishing on a budget, but hooks are not an expensive part. So I put two on there. Again, I fish the Gamagatsu 510 in a two watt. One of the things I like about this hook is the out barb. When you drop, drop this jig down, as it's going down, the hooks are going to come up from the water pressure against it. And those hooks could wrap around the fluorocarbon. And with a traditional hook, it'll have a barb in it, and that barb, once it gets down there, could prevent it from falling back off easily. With the assist hook and the barb being on the outside and a gamagatsu hook, that barb falls off there much easier, doesn't chafe the line, and later in the day after numerous fish, you're not busting it off because the line's chafed. If you're the kind of guy that wants to make your own assist hooks, great. Go on to Amazon 
and get you some parachute cord, 400 pound parachute cord in the red or the orange. I've tried the green and the blue, it's too slick, the knots won't hold. Cut it nine inches. This whole thing is nine inches, double it over, put a half hitch on the hook, tighten it up, and take the loop part that you created and push it back through the back of the eye and pull it tight. Now it's only a half hitch. It won't hold by itself, so typically what I do is I will get a small piece of 3 16 electrical shrink tubing, automotive shrink tubing, and I'll cut a, about a one inch piece of that, slide down over it, and I'll shrink it on there with either a lighter or a cigar torch or something like that. And that tubing will prevent that from coming uh, undone. And you can make those all day long, but uh, if you don't want to buy them. You can buy the 510 assist hooks by the bulk if you'd like to. Uh, they're available. Two aught is the size I prefer. Some of these lures will come with one aught, three aught. The size of the assist hook is not as critical. That's what you're going to do with the lure and the rod and the reel. Okay? So you've got a little flexibility in the hooks there. Okay, we've talked about jigs, styles of jigs, different types of jigs and what they do and how well, the actions. Now it's time to show you the difference and show you what the action looks like. What I'm using is a Daiwa Harrier slow pitch jig rod paired up with a Daiwa Saltiga lever drag reel. This is actually a size 35 reel. The rod is six foot six. And I'm gonna put it up under my arm like this. The first thing I'm gonna show you is high speed jigging, also known as yo-yo jigging. And to use, we're using a Daiwa Saltiga leaf jig You'll notice that the assist hooks are on top of it, and there's only two of them. And for this demonstration, I'm going to hang on to this jig so that way it's not flopping around out there. So the action on this is traditionally a high speed working the rod and reeling erratically. Okay? What that's doing is once you've dropped the jig down, the jig is coming up and it's darting side to side, on its way, erratically coming up, back up. And the tuna are going to take it on the leading edge as it comes, which the leading edge will have the hooks on it. Now, various years and various days, sometimes they want a little bit different action. There's been times out there where the high speed jigging wasn't as effective as a little bit slower jigging. Don't be afraid to play with it a little bit, okay? That is high speed yo-yo jigging. Okay, now we're gonna talk about slow pitch jigging, but first before we do that, I'm still using the same rod, the Harrier X, but, I'm use but I wanna show you that I've got a cover on this lure, and you really should put a cover on your lures these rods are, are so parabolic that when you're running offshore on a sporty day, these rods are up in the rod lockers and the rods are whipping back and forth and this jig will come unhinged from that and unhooked. So if you don't have a cover on this, that jig's up there flying around and will have all your other rods and jigs all tangled up. There's a wrap by Cabela's. This is a Daiwa wrap that they make for theirs and Shimano makes their wrap as well that works really well. So we've got the wrap on here. Oops. And you see I have with the slow pitch jig I have hooks on the top and hooks on the bottom. I have the drag backed off so that way my reeling doesn't cause action there. This is a Daiwa SK jig in the Zebra Glow. One assist hook up on the top, a Gamagatsu 510 2 aught assist hook, and then assist hooks that come with the jig on the bottom of it. And this action is totally different than the high speed jigging action. And because this is a slow pitch jig, 
what we're going to do is we're going to impart action onto it. We're going to let it down into the zone where we want to be. We'll bring the drag up and the action is going to be come up about 90 degrees. You can go half a crank or a full crank, wait three to five seconds and then go back down. And then up. And when you travel down, don't go down so fast that you lose contact with the jig. You want to feel the jig on the way down. Otherwise, you won't feel the fish when he picks it up. So it's just slow action. So it's So you're giving a little bit of time for this jig to do its thing. When you, when you come up with a jig, the jig's going to dart as it comes up. And that's why the hooks are on this edge, because when it darts, you want this jig to come up and go horizontal. And as it's darting and laying flat horizontally, that's when the fish is going to pick it up. Now when you drop the jig down, it's going to go slack, and the bottom, it's going to go down and horizontal again. So it's, you need to keep the jig horizontal for the jig to work right. That's why you need to give it time once you drop down before you come back up. You need to give it three to five seconds for it to do its thing. Three seconds, you're probably fine. It's just a jig action. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. And then periodically put a crank in there. And you'll Reel this up a little ways. Once you think you're out of the zone, drop it back down into the zone where you th believe the fish are and start doing the action again. You can do this all day long. And put different colors of jigs on different rods to see which one might be working better than others and then switch to that jig. That's slow pitch. Now we're gonna talk about long jigs. And it's a slow pitch action, but it's a long jig, okay? So we've got high pitch, slow pitch, and the high pitch typically is with the longer jigs. And the action on that is more erratic. So we're coming up more, we're staying longer, five seconds, six seconds. We're traveling down longer, but remember when I travel down, I need to go down with my jig so I stay in contact with it. So I come up, partial crank, wait, and then travel back down. Wait, five, six, okay. And you can speed that up or speed that down as long as you stay in contact with it and periodically crank again. All right, this concludes my work in the iron seminar. If you didn't catch it earlier, make sure you catch the seminar on fish mapping and advanced techniques on how to find fish. And that goes into a lot more detail on electronics as well as Sirius XM's new fish mapping that was just out just in the last year. Very different, very interesting. Um, and thank you for your time. Thank you for logging on and watching this.